The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Okay, Psalm 41. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil of me. When will he die and his name perish? And if he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt. An evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now that he lies down, he will rise no more. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. We know that's speaking of Judas. But you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are well pleased with me, because my enemy does not triumph over me. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Okay, we're in chapter 2 of Esther now. This is Esther 2, 1 through 11. It's entitled, In Search of a Queen. And Esther 2, starting in the first verse. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel in the woman's quarters under the custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women. And let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's command and decree was heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Hegai, that Esther was also taken to the king's palace into the care of Hegai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor, so he readily gave her beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Now, if you followed along in the New King James Version, there are a couple of errors in their translation. They've inserted some words which do not belong there, and they've had some uh, uh, names that are not in accordance with the Hebrew. I just want to let you know that, and we'll talk about that as we go through here. Bad starts do not always mean bad finishes, and we all know this. We've seen the game. We've watched the race. We've heard of the person born in poverty who rose above his circumstances and so on. And the same is true in the Bible. There are bad starts, and there are great finishes. Humanity started out poorly in Adam, but Christ turned things around, didn't he? What lies ahead is rather magnificent because of him. Of the sons of Israel, some started out well. Reuben was the firstborn of Jacob. That's a good start, but he didn't finish too well. 
His father's final words from his deathbed were rather terse, and they close out with the anticipation of things not excelling for Reuben in the future. Benjamin did not start out well. He was the last of Jacob's sons, and his mother died in giving him birth. In fact, she named him Ben-Oni, son of my suffering. Were it not for dad renaming him with a very positive name, it would have seemed like he would always be on the bad side of things. But like his naming and renaming, Benjamin takes a parallel course in history. He remained somewhat in obscurity, but eventually, during the time of the judges, he was caught up in something so wicked and so perverse that it looked like he might not survive at all. He was reduced to a mere 600 men. He may have blinked off into extinction at this point, but he continued on. The bad streak didn't end there, though. Saul, the first king of Israel, was from Benjamin, and it seemed like things had turned around for them, but Saul returned them around and lost the kingship. Benjamin's infancy was one of suffering, and it seemed like it was destined to continue. But along with these and other bad things which happened to him, he is now given a chance to make things better. That really isn't an apparent in the story yet, but the very fact that Benjamin is singled out shows us that this is possible. Will the son of suffering take on a new direction? Will he become the son of the right hand? Well, all things are possible. The Apostle Paul sure found that out himself. That's our text verse for today from Philippians chapter 3. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised on the eighth day, a point to brag in, of the stock of Israel, something to brag in, of the tribe of Benjamin, something to brag in, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. What? Paul, a Benjamite and proud of it? Where does he get such confidence? While penning his words to those at Philippi, he was probably thinking about the events right from the book of Esther and probably about verse 5 of chapter 2. He knew the story. He celebrated it year by year at the Feast of Purim, and it could have been a source of great boasting for him that he was from this tribe, highlighted here for the first time in the book of Esther. Great things had come from Benjamin, including the apostle Paul. But Paul would have us less happy for him about his heritage and lineage than he would have us fix our eyes on Jesus, the true son of the right hand. These names, these stories, these actual events in human history, all of these things only point to the one who provides the greatest finish of them all. We have little victories in life that change our destiny and put us on a path to success, fame, wealth, or whatever. But unless the Lord is in the equation, in the end, it just doesn't matter. The billionaire will turn back to the same dust as the bum in the streets. The movie star will putrefy just the same as the ditch digger. And the stockbroker is heading to the same end as the 7-Eleven clerk. Benjamin started poorly, but Benjamin will get a chance to end well. But that good ending is only because of the Lord who directs the events and calls people to himself. If the response is made, then good will come of things not just for this life, but for all of the ages to come. After finishing the list of things that he could brag in, that he could brag in, Paul tells us of what value those things are in relation to what is truly worthy of boasting. He says, But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. In the end, the entire Bible is to lead us to that one person who is worth boasting in, Jesus this is a truth which is to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again. And may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I've got three thoughts for you today. The first one is queen instead of Vashti. It's verses 1 through 4. After these things, verse 1, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided. The words, after these things, take us back to all that occurred concerning Vashti her refusal to heed the king, and everything resulting from that embarrassing ordeal. It is at some point after this that Kesok Hamat Hamalech Ahashverosh was subsided, wrath, the king Ahasuerus. The word for subsided is rather rare. It was seen in Genesis and then again in Numbers, and it will be seen here in Esther twice and then only one more time in the book of Jeremiah. 
It comes from a root meaning to weave a trap. And so figuratively, through the idea of secreting something away, it gives the sense of subsiding or pacifying. The second time it will be seen in Esther is in verse 710, where it is again used to speak of the subsiding of the king's wrath. Thus, it is the basis for forming a new set of twos. The first subsiding of the king's anger is after his actions against Vashti, and it will lead to setting up the decision to find a queen to replace her, leading to Esther being selected to fill her vacancy. The second subsiding of his anger is after his actions against the wicked Haman, who is not yet introduced, and will set up the decision to replace Haman with Mordecai, filling his vacancy. In both, there is a replacing of a Gentile with a Jew. One is a female, one is a male. The two accounts contrast, and yet they confirm the hand of God in the appointment of two of his chosen people to fill the highest roles of the king's life and government. Both are of the same tribe and family, Benjamin, or son of my right hand. It is a fitting name when considering that in verse 8, 8, both Esther and Mordecai are given royal authority using the king's signet ring to then issue an edict which will save the Jews. As the signet is the symbol of the king's right hand or authority, the fact that they are from Benjamin points directly to Jesus Christ as the true savior of the Jews and the true son of the right hand. All of this can be gleaned from a simple statement using a particular word that the king's wrath had shachach, or subsided. It prefigures the replacement of Adam by Jesus, pictured by Mordecai, and also those merely circumcised in the flesh with those circumcised in the heart. And that is seen in Vashti and Esther. Paul speaks of both. First of Mordecai. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, the first man was of the earth, Adam, made of dust. The second man, Jesus, I'm adding those words in here so you understand what he's talking about, is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of the dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of that man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Mordecai will replace Haman who acted wickedly, being a follower of the works of the devil as we are shown in 1 John 3, verse 8. Christ came and replaced Adam, who acted wickedly when he believed the lies of the devil. For man, that sad state is overturned by the work of Christ. Second, we see this in Esther from Romans chapter 2. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Esther replaces the wayward Vashti. She was externally beautiful, but her internal attitude was not directed towards the king's command, circumcision of the flesh only. Esther will be both internally and externally obedient towards what is right, circumcision of the heart. Although we're jumping ahead in order to understand our sets of twos, it's okay because we will get to number two, two. And when we do, we can then review everything that we have here looked in two. That is, if it's okay with you. It won't be seen until verse 16 of this chapter exactly when Esther will be chosen as the queen. But for now, we can review the historical timeline. The feast at Susa of chapter 1 we saw was in the year 483 B.C. In the spring of the year 481 B.C., Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, set out for Greece. It is sometime about these dates that these events begin to occur. There is a long absence of time between the events of chapter 1 and later in chapter 2, which is perfectly explained by the Greek campaign, which is recorded in extra-biblical history. In other words, the account is perfectly reliable, and it fits with historical records which are found elsewhere. Verse 1 continues, He remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. The words here give the sense that the king actually wished that he had not made the decision and enacted the decree. 
Whether he could actually override his edict or whether it was impossible according to law hardly matters. As I said last week, people argue over whether he could or could not have. Even if he could, by overriding it, he would demonstrate that his decision was not firm, fixed, and final. It would reflect a vacillating king who had been more influenced by wine than by sound judgment. This could not be allowed. And so the sense of almost sadness at what had come about is seen in these words of this verse. The king was left without a queen that he probably otherwise adored, and his decree finalized the matter. This is all the more surely the case because he already would have had a harem, and yet there is no sense of pleasure in any of them. Otherwise, the another which we saw in verse 119 would have been an easy replacement. Remember, that guy came up and he said, we'll find another one for you, and he was implying somebody from the royal harem. But none of the harem interested him. We can almost see one of the royal court asking him, why haven't you chosen a queen, a new one, to replace Vashti? His answer, none of the concubines interest me. And so to repair the situation, this deficiency, an exciting new avenue is recommended. Verse 2. And then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. The king's servants mentioned here are not the royal court of seven. Instead, they're probably the attendants of the court, such as eunuchs and the like, who serve the king and who would personally be affected by his disposition and aware of his demeanor. They would also know of his preferences concerning the harem and were aware that none of them was agreeable to the king as a replacement queen. And so, as a point of self-interest in having a happy king, they set forth their proposal. Four words are used to describe the women in the proposal. Nerot, betulot, tovot, mare. Young women, virgins, beautiful in appearance. In this, they have covered all of the desired basis. They are to be young and thus not set in their mind and in their demeanor. They are to be virgins, an obvious qualification. To not be a virgin would be wholly unsuited to the distinction of being presented to the king. And they were to be beautiful in appearance, another obvious requirement. Verse 3, and let the king appoint officers in all of the provinces of his kingdom. The kingdom consisted of 127 provinces from India all the way around to Ethiopia, with princes appointed over them. It is a giant swath of land with an enormous number of cultures and languages. In appointing officers in each province, they would be able to search out the most beautiful and cultured of all of the women, even if only one was chosen from each province as the epitome of those she represented. It would increase the king's harem by 127 women of every color, culture, and ethnicity. The officers would be meticulously careful to find the very best as it would reflect favorably on them and their status before the king. Verse 3 continues, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel. From their home, to which they would never return, and unless chosen as queen from their family whom they would never, never see again, these women would become the property of the king and would spend their lives at the citadel awaiting his call. Verse 3 continues, into the women's quarters, El Beit Hanashim, unto house the women. This would be a house where women were separately maintained. In one part of the house would be the virgins, and another part would be the wives or the concubines. And they would be kept under separate governors who would be over them, serving the king's interests. Verse 3 continues, under the custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women. Hege. It actually reads H-E-G-E -E in the Hebrew, so if you have Hegai in that verse, you can make a pen and ink correction. Hege, as the Hebrew reads, is seen only here in chapter 2. He will also be called Hegai, but it is the same person. The context of the passage seems to show that he is the keeper of the entire house of the women, both virgins and the non-virgin concubines or wives. He is a eunuch, something rather necessary for someone being placed in such a position of authority under the king of the land. Verse 3 continues, And let beauty preparations be given them, venaton tamruchehen, and giving cosmetic purification. The verb here in the Hebrew is in the infinitive absolute form, which highlights and gives prominence to the act. As John Lang says, it presupposes the subject as being self-evident. If this was modern English then, the thought might be, and of course, naturally, she will be purified in the usual way. 
I'm making that point because that's the way the Hebrew reads. It's saying, we're going to do these things, and of course, we're going to take care of her for you, okay? This customary way of purification introduces the word tamruk. In the Bible, it will only be seen three times, all in this chapter. It comes from the word marak, meaning to polish or to scour. Thus, it would be purification by rubbing. There would be cosmetics combined into soap or oil, and then the rubbing may have been with hands or towels or even a nice soft loofah. Whatever is intended, it would have been a pretty delightful way to be pampered. <coughs> Verse 4, then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. Going under the assumption that only one young woman was selected from each province, that still leaves the odds extremely slim for any particular girl to be chosen. Therefore, in order to be the one who pleases the king, she would have to be not only beautiful, but cultured, wise, pleasantly emotional, but not overly so, bold in one way, but completely submissive in another, and so on. The idea of you only get one chance to make a first impression is wholly true here. To be chosen would mean a completely different type of life lay ahead than to be rejected and to forever remain a concubine. Verse 4 continues, this thing pleased the king, and he did so. With the coming war with Greece, the order would go out, and there would have been plenty of time for selecting the finest virgins, for the women to be gathered, and then to educate them in the Persian language, and to properly prepare them according to the standards of purification. Further, an extended period under eunuch control would ensure that no chance of an already pregnant girl could be presented to him. <coughs> Thus, there was no rush in the matter, and the longer the period, the better for both the king and for the potential queen. He is pleased with the suggestion, and so it would be carried out in a thorough and meticulous way. A chaste virgin to be presented to the king, prepared and presented for his delight. A woman who will make his heart sing. A woman who outshines the darkness of night. Who will it be that is presented to the king, who is the one chosen for the king's delight? The call has gone out, like a bell, it does ring, for a chaste and perfect virgin, beautiful to the sight. So the king will rejoice in his precious bride, the beautiful virgin in whom he does delight. Forever she will remain at his side, and together they will outshine the darkness of the night. Our second thought today is Hadassah, that is, Esther, verses 5 through 7. Verse 5, in Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew. The Hebrew here is laid out completely differently than almost all English translations. It begins with the words, Ish Yehudi Haya, man, Jew, there was. It is an abrupt and sudden change from the previous narrative concerning the king, the royal court, and the various things which transpired there. It is obviously a grammatical form used to introduce a complete contrast to what has been stated, and a look forward to what lies ahead. The scholars at Cambridge state the influence which he, a Jew, is to have upon history is thus placed in significant contrast with the brilliancy of the court of Susa. This is correct. The Jews had been in exile. Though the exile was ended by Cyrus in 529 BC, many are scattered among the nations and they have been out of favor with God. Jerusalem was not yet a walled and vibrant city. That wouldn't occur until the time of Nehemiah in 445 BC. The Jews are in a lowly state, which has been completely contrasted to the royal scene which has thus far been presented. This Jew is right in Shushan, the citadel. From later in the narrative, it would rightly be assumed that he is either a eunuch himself or a doorkeeper in the king's employ, although there could be some further explanation for his ability to access the women's court. More about this Jew is next revealed. Verse 5 continues, whose name was Mordecai. The name Mordecai is generally debated as belonging either to a Persian word, Mordecai, meaning little man, or it is tied to the name of the Babylonian god Marduk, and thus it would mean pertaining to Marduk. If this is so, it's not without precedent. The name Daniel was changed to reflect that of a Babylonian god, as were others. If Mordecai was a eunuch or a doorkeeper, he would serve among the royals and would be renamed accordingly. As Paul means small, I would go with Mordecai, little man, showing a connection between the two. Verse 5 continues, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish. Here are listed four names which are widely debated. Some see them as his four immediate ancestors. 
But this is unlikely. Names of ancestors in scripture are at times given to highlight a particular genealogy without specifically naming all in that genealogy. This is the case with Jesus' record in Matthew 1. If you follow it, it skips many kings in the record of his genealogy. The term Ben means son, but it can be, and it often is, a generational term. One can be a son of Abraham even today, for example. All of us who have called on Christ would be sons of Abraham by faith. In this case, he was either the direct son of Jair, or Jair may be listed for another reason, which I'm going to explain in verse 6. From there, Mordecai is the son by ancestry of Shimei, who is recorded as having cursed King David in 2 Samuel 16, verse 5. Eventually, this same person was executed by David's son Solomon in 1 Kings 2, verse 46. Kish then is named as his next important ancestor. Though Shimei's father was a guy named Gera, it is Kish who is significant, being the father of King Saul, the first king of Israel. Therefore, Kish is the tie between these two genealogies. It is from his house that both King Saul and Mordecai through Shimei come. They are both sons of Kish according to ancestry. This Kish is mentioned by Saul or Paul in Acts 13 verse 21. The importance of this connection to Kish lies yet ahead in the story. We'll get to that probably next week. The name of Kish is connected to the word Kush. It's a verb meaning to ensnare. Thus, Kish means to snare. Verse 5 continues, a Benjamite. Finally, we learn here that the term Yehudi, or Jew, only indicates that he fell under the broader term, which is now being used to designate any person of any tribe in Israel. He is thus both a Jew and a Benjamite. Again, Benjamin means son of the right hand. Is anybody seeing pictures of Christ yet? We only got about 10 more sermons and we'll put them all together for you, okay? I uh, am typing the second half of chapter 9 tomorrow, and then the week after that, I'll type chapter 10. Chapter 10 is only three verses long, so I've got to make up a lot of stuff. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm not. I'm going to tie it all together for you, okay? Anyway, it's an exciting adventure. I have no idea where it's going to end yet. I do know the general outline. I talked it over with Sergio and Rhoda, and they were floored. But we still have another half of a chapter to go, and then we'll tie it together. Verse 6, Kish. Anybody got Kish there in their uh, Bible translation? You can scratch that out. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. The name Kish is incorrectly inserted here. The Hebrew simply says, which had been carried away. It is speaking in a general term, not of either Kish or Mordecai. Rather, this means that this family line to Mordecai had been carried away. In fact, it very well may be that Jair, who is then listed for this very reason, he being an ancestor who saw exile. Though more of a paraphrase, the New Living Translation gives the correct sense of this verse. Here's what they say. His family had been among those who, with King Jehoiakim of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. See, now you read the New King James Version, and they have put it in italics that it's Kish, They've inserted that name, but if you read that, you just assume that they're correct, and now you've got a completely wrong interpretation of what is going on here. It's very important why Kish is the father of Saul. We'll see that later, as I said. It is this family line which eventually was carried away along with Jeconiah, king of Judah, by Nebuchadnezzar. That was more than 100 years before. As a side note, this is the only time that Jerusalem is mentioned in the book of Esther. Further, it is spelled in an alternate way than normal. It is pronounced Yerushalayim here instead of Yerushalem. Why do I know that? I don't know. I just like to find those things out. Okay, she's over there asking Jim that question. As a completely amazing point, of the acrostics, and there are lots of acrostics that are found in this chapter, but of the acrostics which are found in this verse, which as I showed you last week, it's the first or last letter of a sentence, right? And it can go forward or backward. In this one verse... The acrostic found here, four of them, there are five in this one verse, four of them are the same word, mehera, or in a hurry. Two are in the noun form, and two are in the verb form. They form from reading the verse both forward and backwards. It is exceptional, and I have to tell you, the chances of this being random are exactly zero. Verse 7, and Mordecai had brought up Hadassah. This is the only time that the name Hadassah is used in the Bible. It means myrtle. 
The myrtle is one of the branches used by the Jews to build their sukkah in the Feast of Tabernacles according to Nehemiah 8, verse 15. It is also one of the prophetic pictures of God's promised blessings in Isaiah 55, verse 13. The hadas, or myrtle, is from the same root as hodem, or footstool. The root means to stamp upon. One can think of stamping out sin. If that's not in your notes, it's because I just realized that this morning, so I apologize. <laughs> Thus, it is quite appropriate to the story of saving and blessing the Jewish people. I'll tie all that in in the last sermon. Verse 7 continues. That is Esther. The name Esther comes from a Persian word meaning star. Specifically, it would be the star Venus. They thought that the planets were stars that just moved differently. Okay, So the star Venus indicating beauty and good fortune. However, the name of Esther to a Hebrew would remind the audience of two different thoughts, both having a bearing on the story. The first is a compound word, which would sound like she searches out evil. That would be relevant to the heroine. The second is more relevant to the story itself. The name sounds like a word signifying hiding. And so Esther would sound like I am hidden. It is exactly what we've discussed in the hidden and yet fully evident presence of the Lord in the book and of the hidden acrostics pointing to the Lord in the book as well. Verse 7 continues, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. This makes her his own first cousin. He was obviously older and took care of her from the time of the parents passing. As the Lord directs the life of man, it is obvious that he directed the death of the parents in order to bring Esther into Mordecai's life to save the Jews. One can make the obvious deductions by simply stepping back and seeing how God has orchestrated each step of what occurs in order to meet his purposes and to fulfill his promises. Remember Leviticus 26. I mean, right at the end of the book of Leviticus, and then we decided to go into Esther for a short break and all of the promises that were made there. And they're being fulfilled right in this book. The Lord is working behind the scenes, never mentioned in the book of Esther, and yet you know he's there. And with the hidden acrostics of his name, you know he's there even more. Verse 7 continues, the young woman was lovely and beautiful. The same words are used to describe both Rachel and Joseph as that of Esther, beautiful of form. In addition to this, another adjective signifying beautiful in sight is added on. She was both shapely and pleasing to the eyes, each a gift of God. But the opposite cannot be considered a curse. Thank goodness, because I'm as ugly as a, a box. I know that. God endows beauty according to his wisdom in order to complete the course of his will. One can anticipate the details of the story at this point. She has met the requirements for beauty of the royal decision. Now we just have to watch the story unfold. Verse 7 continues, When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. This was not by chance, but according to will. God's will was for the saving of the Jews. And so according to that greater purpose, the parents were taken away. Mordecai's will was for the safety of his cousin and the preservation of her Jewishness. And so according to that greater purpose, he took her in as his own daughter. Possibly being a eunuch or a doorkeeper, he was already close to the royal court. This further met the plan which was to be realized by the Lord. The realization begins in verse 8. In search of a queen to be by my side, a radiant beauty to live with throughout the ages, a chaste virgin prepared as a bride whose beauty exceeds the poems of thousands of pages, adorned as a queen in royal splendor, gloriously apparelled such a beautiful sight, a bride like no other so soft and tender and glistening with jewels, shining and bright, a bride fit for a king, radiant and lovely as she, one to bring joy forever to the king's heart, the perfect union, so shall it forever be. Nothing will separate them, nor tear them apart. Our third thought today is under the hand of Haggai. It's verse 8 through 11. Verse 8. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many of the young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that Esther was also taken to the king's palace. The king's command is his spoken approval. The decree or written law is what would have been issued based on that. Josephus records that there were approximately 400 women gathered together at this time. That means more than two from each of the provinces. That's a lot of ladies being brought, Esther being one of them. 
It is possible that the name Esther is being used in a future manner, having been given to her sometime after coming into the palace. However, it very well may be that Mordecai called her Esther and told her to use this name in order to hide her identity before entering the palace. They would go along then with what is stated in verse 10. This now introduces another set of twos. This one corresponds to the second gathering of virgins recorded in verse 219, which we'll see next week. The first gathering is to find a queen. The second gathering is after a queen has been selected. The first gathering was for the king to find sufficiency in a queen. The second is to fill a void in the king's desired harem. One meant a good life for Esther. The second could mean death for her. They contrast, and yet they confirm that the king was always on the lookout for others to find pleasure in. Verse 8 continues, Into the care of Hegai, the custodian of the women. El Yad Hegai Shomer Hanashim. Literally, into the hand of Hegai, keeper of the women. The spelling of the name Hegai varies from Hegai of verse 3, but it is referring to the same person. The only difference in the spelling of the names is the final letter, which changes from an aleph to a yod, previously known as a yad, which means hand. In this verse, Esther has been placed into the hand of Hegai, and the spelling of his name reflects that change. It is into his hand the care of this vitally important woman has been placed. Verse 9, now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor. Esther's beauty must have been extraordinary. Hegai would have had countless, countless girls under his care, virgins, concubines, lesser wives, and female attendants for all of them. And yet he was truly smitten with Esther, probably both in her physical looks and in her comportment and demeanor. He saw someone who was truly fitting as a queen, and in preparing her, he would be possibly finding even greater favor in the eyes of his king. For him to place her in the order in which she arrived would be to keep her from the king longer than might be necessary. This might be a source of the king's wrath for him later. If the king chose someone else before coming to Esther and then was given Esther as a concubine, Hegai might look like the world's worst keeper of the women. These words bring in another set of twos. Here Esther finds chesed lepanav, or loving kindness, before him. This will be repeated concerning Esther in the eyes of the king in verse 217. Here, it is the favor of the keeper of the women. There, it concerns the love of the king. They contrast, and yet they confirm that she was pleasing in all ways as a refined and beautiful woman. Because he has found her exceptional, he moves to prepare her for the king with all alacrity. Verse 9 continues, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. The word translated as so he readily is vebahel. The word gives the sense of being dismayed. In this, the sense of hurriedly or urgently is seen. In 2 Chronicles 26, King Uzziah illegally burnt incense before the Lord. When he did, leprosy broke out on his forehead. In response to this, the priests hurried him out of the sanctuary. This is the sense of the word. Hegai was almost in a panic to have this marvelous beauty prepared for the king. And this is seen the second of three times that the word tamruk, or items for purification, is found. She was quickly started on this course of preparation and also given mana, or a special diet of food, as most good translations will state it. Those selected for the king's service, be it virgins or wise men, were given a special portion of food as their diet. Verse 9 continues, Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace. The word maidservants is prefixed with the word the. In other words, it is stating that there were designated seven maidservants to assist her and prepare her as a candidate to being queen. This then is more than just a glamour fest. It is an entire body of training and introduction into how to conduct oneself in the king's palace. These seven would prepare both her physical looks, such as in bathing, hair care, and the like, but they would also train her in etiquette, manners, customs, and so on. The word choice to describe these maidservants is a participle of the verb ra'ah, which is used for a very particular purpose in both the Talmud and in rabbinical Hebrew, and which occurs only here in the entire Bible. 
It shows the special care of Esther as she is being readied for her encounter with the king. Haggai has gone to enormous lengths to ensure that Esther would be ready, that she would be ready quickly, and that she would be fully ready. And as a sign of true endearment to this fabulous beauty, he does more. Verse 9 continues, And he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. It is as if Haggai anticipates the outcome of the selection. He not only does all that he can for her to prepare her for what was to come, but he gives her the quarters which reflect what she would receive. The rooms would have been palatial, airy, and a delight to the senses. It is obvious that even if the king had not yet made his selection, guess what? Haggai had already done so for him. Verse 10, Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her to not reveal it. This verse is supplementary to what has just been said about Esther's exceptional treatment, but the reason for it is not stated. Here, she has been commanded by Mordecai to not reveal either her people, meaning being Jewish, or her line of birth, meaning being of the stock of Israel. Many scholars say that if her Jewish roots had been known, it would have been a setback to her chances to becoming the queen, as if being Jewish itself was a liability. But that makes absolutely no sense at all. If the best beauties of all of the provinces were gathered together, it would include the province of Judea. There is no reason to assume that that is correct. However, being raised in Shushan, her spoken Persian would be flawless. It would be a plus if she were assumed to be a native Persian, even if it was not a minus to being a foreigner. If she, without lying, said, I am from Shushan, it would be utterly delightful to both Haggai and the king that such a beauty was reared right in their backyard. Such seems to be the thinking on Mordecai's mind. This verse initiates yet another set of twos. It is that Esther has concealed her identity. That is first found here, and then again in verse 220, we'll see it. The first is at the command of Mordecai, and the second is in obedience to the command. They contrast, and yet they confirm the obedience of Esther to her adopted father. Verse 11 finishes our verses today with these words, And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Unlike the parents of all of the other girls who would probably never hear of the state of their daughters, Mordecai was able to find out about Esther's affairs. In whatever capacity he served, he was able to access the front of the women's quarters and inquire about her there. Even in this, one can see the Lord's hand working behind the scenes. He has chose someone with at least partial access to find out what is going on and to maintain a relationship with the person who would eventually become the queen. Each step of the story continues to show that despite Israel's inability to stay faithful to their God and the covenant cut between them, such is not the case with the Lord. He is there tending to his promises and ensuring that his chosen people would not be destroyed by a wicked plot against them. They had been exiled, some had returned and begun life in Israel again, but there were still many, many scattered throughout the nations, and soon all of them, every single one of them would be threatened by the evil intent of one man. But God has a greater plan that is being worked out in the background, like a meticulous clock that strikes the seconds, and then the minutes, and then the hours, ever faithful to proclaim the march of time, the Lord is there silently moving circumstances as he sees fit to faithfully proclaim the cycle of redemption from beginning to end. He took Enoch away for his purposes. He saved Noah through the flood to continue them on. He called Abraham. He chose Isaac, and he faithfully led Jacob. His favor went toward Rahab, a harlot, and he called Ruth, a young Gentile widow, to be his own. Here in Esther, this beautifully woven tapestry is continuing on. For Israel, in anticipation of Christ and to secure a people from the Gentiles. He is never, never distant or uninterested. Though we normally don't see it until after the fact, he is there working to bring all things to a good end for those who trust him. This must be true. What would God merit in stepping out of the eternal realm, uniting with humanity, and dying on a cross if it wasn't for a very good end. Think about it. 
If nothing else, the cross of Christ shows us that God is completely interested in every single one of us. So be of good cheer, do the right thing, and call out to Jesus. As caring as the Lord is about what occurred in the palace at Shushan, he is just as caring about what occurs with you. And so as I do each week, I'd like to tell you the simple path to salvation. The Bible says that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. It is sin which separates us from God and it is inherited. So we don't need to do anything other than being conceived in order to be separated from God. David wrote about that in the 51st Psalm. Surely from my mother's womb, I was sinful at birth, right? Or it's already done. And then we just heap on more sin during our life and we're further separated from God. The wages of sin is death. We die because we have sin in our lives and all have sinned and all are going to die. That's what the Bible proclaims. And then it gives that marvelous, gigantic word for us to consider. But, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All we have to do is simply believe that God sent his son in the world to take away our sin debt, to believe that in our heart and to proclaim it, and we will be saved. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no maybe, there's no loss of salvation, any of that kind of stuff recorded in the Bible. You are saved. What you do after your salvation, though, however, will be counted as rewards and losses. We're all going to stand before the Lord Jesus. So the first thing to do is to get right with the Lord by calling on him. Oh, God, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. And I accept that you sent your son in order to take my sin debt. And I believe that you raised him from the dead. Why? The wages of sin is death. If Christ had no sin and died as our sin bearer, but no sin of his own, then he had to come out of the grave. And that's what Peter says in Acts chapter 2. It was impossible that he could stay in a grave because he had no sin of his own. The wages of sin is death, and he had none. So out he came. Just believe that, and you will be saved. And then from there, give your life to the Lord wholeheartedly. You don't need to become a preacher or a minister. Well, you just do your job. If you're a plumber, plumb well. Talk about Jesus and talk to him while you're working. Oh, Lord, thank you for this job I got today. Whatever. Everything that you do in faith will be a source of rewards. And anything you do that isn't in faith will be a source of loss. It's that simple. Have faith. Give your life to the Lord and have faith in his provision every moment of every day. I've got a closing verse for you today from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Anybody seeing some connections all of a sudden? But I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We try to make the gospel so complicated, don't we? Oh, you got to tithe. You got to do this. You got to observe that day. You've got to do this thing and that. I mean, people heap it on. You cannot earn grace. Grace is unmerited favor. That's what it is. If you try to earn it, it's no longer grace. Keep it simple. He says, from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Don't. Don't put up with it. Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe it. I am saved. Deal done forever. Nothing else required. Okay, and then go and do something else. But it's not required. It's your rewards that you'll receive for doing it. Keep the gospel simple. God made it the most simple thing in the world, so simple that he calls it what? A stumbling block. And you see this big pulpit? Is anybody going to walk up to it and keep walking? No, they're going to walk around it. Stumbling block is something so small you don't even see it and it trips you up. It's the simplicity of the gospel. Grace, God's grace. He loves us that much. Next week is Esther 2, 12 through 23. What will be the outcome of this thing? It's entitled, A Night with the King. That'll be our fourth Esther sermon. And I'll tell you this, the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. At times, you might feel as if he has no great design for you in life, but he has brought you to this moment to reveal his glory in and through you. So follow him and trust him, and he will do marvelous things for you and through you, okay? Our poem today, very short, In Search of a Queen. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, 
He remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her after the course of his wrath had run. Then the king's servants who attended him said with a notable ring, let beautiful virgins be sought for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom. So do you, we tell that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel into the women's quarters under the custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch custodian of the women whom on the virgins he keeps his eye and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Ashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. Yes, he did this thing. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. More of Mordecai? You bet, we will hear. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured in the fray with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter, so they were related, for she had neither father nor mother, as the Bible to us has stated. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter, parenting skills to her he applied. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel, under the custody of Hegai, as the story does tell, that Esther was also taken to the king's palace there and then, into the care of Hegai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor, so we know. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her, besides her allowance, to her he did bestow. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the palace of the king, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women, so for her he did this thing. Esther had not yet revealed her people or her family one little bit, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her from any passing reporters. Lord God, thank you for your presence that is with us. Even when we don't realize that you are there because you sent your own son, Jesus, we know that you truly do care. And so, Lord, be real to us in a wonderful new way. Open our minds and our hearts to seeing you always through every step we take and throughout every day. Be real to us, O oh God, and to you we shall give all of our praise. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this wonderful story. It continues to show us that you are there at all times, even in the times when we feel completely abandoned, when we're left alone and we're in misery. I have a friend on Facebook who lost her son this past week, and I know she probably feels that way, but she's also strengthening herself in the Lord her God, and I'm so thankful for that. And it's so good to know that we can come to you in these times and know that you're there, and we can see it right in the book of Esther that you are there working behind the scenes, even when people don't acknowledge you, even when people don't show that they care about you in any way, shape, or form, you are guiding the circumstances. Thank you for that. Oh, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We exalt you. And we do so in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Amen. I don't think this is going to work again today. We're going to try it, though. <laughs> Fold it up there a little bit. Yeah, it's one of those slippery shirts, so. All right. We get the uh, instruction for the Lord's Supper directly from the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul wrote these wonderful words for us. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And he would have given thanks over this. He would have said, Baruch Atha Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it. And he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the wine and he would have given a blessing over this as well. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGuffin. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I said Judy brought that. Yeah. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is grace. Why can't people get that? The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hide the Janna. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We uh, got a gift from Judy here. She brought in, she says, oh, this is for you, and you can put it wherever you want. And I said, oh, we're going to put it in the church. That way everybody gets to enjoy it. So I saw a couple of you noticed it as you came up. Thank you very much, Judy. And uh, I have to, from time to time, you know, we guys get out there and go to mission work every Saturday. We've been doing this for 11 years. And... Um, and just from time to time, I have to mention how nice it is to have a couple ladies show up out there now as well. We've got two ladies that we can't get rid of them. She, 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 Chris has been coming. You haven't missed one single Sunday in a year, in, over a year now. Is that right? Or Saturday. Is that right? One Saturday in over a year. And then Lori is there every single week as well. It's such a treasure to have them. I was kidding about the getting rid of you. It's just amazing. It's so nice to have people that just want to fellowship in the Lord and do things like that. And, you know, if you ever have a Saturday and you're free and you want to go down the projects and come on, it's not the right time right now, though. It's getting really hot, you know. Wow. It gets, because the sun, the, the projects usually go in this direction and the sun comes right down there and there is no wind and it can be the hottest place on the planet. But anyway, hats off to everybody that helps out with that. 
Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful blessings of this life. And we have all those people that were mentioned at the beginning of this service today with afflictions. Wow, some of them are just really debilitating. And we pray for each and every one of them and anybody else that is having troubles and trials. And also the loss of a son, the, the you know, financial problems and all of the other things which burden our hearts. I don't know how people make it in the world without you, Lord, but people try to do it and they always fail. But with you, there is a source to go to for comfort. And we ask that you would provide it to them through their affliction and even if by your will to heal them quickly and to just uh, miraculously take care of their pains, we would pray for that as well. But thine will be done. You are sovereign over us and we just leave these things in your capable hands. But we do pray them and we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.